follow We All Munch. Um, and she is going to uh, discuss how we should be considering the human genome from a patient's point of view. Sure. Great. Thanks very much, Eric and Larry and others, for inviting me here. And I know that uh, my good friend Terry is worried about her flight, so I will make this uh, fairly quick. And I'm not going to use slides. I usually pretend and be a poser to be a scientist with groups uh, and typically use slides and talk about data, et cetera. Uh, but instead, I'm going to come to you uh, purely from a patient, consumer, public kind of point of view in a very brief perspective around what that means. I am the parent of two kids with a disease called pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and that's a uh, rare genetic condition that causes, um, sorry, that causes, uh, causes uh, uh, calcification, mineralization of the mid-dermis of the skin, the mid-laminar layer of the arteries, and the worst part about it is uh, the Brooks membrane, which causes vision loss around age 30 or 40 for most individuals. Our kids were diagnosed two days before Christmas in 1994. Um, we were shocked, just like any parents who think that they have two normal children, and everybody, once your kids are past a certain age, realize none of them are normal. Um, <laughs> But we pretty much thought we had two healthy kids, they were six and four, and essentially learned this um, horrible thing and not, didn't understand at all what it meant. Th so 1994, there was some pretty good genetics going on, at least in terms of gene discovery, et cetera. We pretty much walked into that as two parents would, expecting that, of course, once the diagnosis came, which came from our dermatologist, that in fact somebody would tell us everything else we needed to know about the disease, and they'd also give us the treatment. We quickly learned, uh, in fact, by the time the Christmas season was over, that there was very little known about the disease, which is typical of the 7,000 rare genetic disorders, and that if anything was to be done, we were going to have to do it. So my husband and I, by uh, sometime around uh, New Year's, had read every journal article we could find, and my background is I'm, I have a master's in religious studies. I was a college chaplain. My husband was a trade school graduate who had done fire protection engineering for the Boston hospitals. So we found ourselves wallowing through all this technical language that we had never heard of. We were buying ourselves encyclopedias and dictionaries. Um, and we eventually understood enough to know that not enough was known. We also learned really quickly that the culture around science and medicine was not what we expected. And instead of answers, in fact, scientists were coming to us for the blood and tissue of our children. The first ones that came day after Christmas, we said, sure, you know, absolutely take these vials of blood from our kids. The second ones that came about two days after that, these were SIBs and they were trying to do um, uh, studies to find the gene, said, in fact, um, we'd like blood as well. And we said, wait a minute, you know, these are little kids, go get the blood from the other guys. And, we, and they said, are you kidding? You know, this was Harvard, the other was Mount Sinai Hospital, no way were people going to collaborate. So that shocked us as parents that people in the science realm competed rather than cooperated around especially such important things as somebody's health. And what we did is we set up a blood and tissue bank, believing that while all these cats supposedly were not to be herded, in fact, you can herd cats if you move the food, and if we made the blood and tissue the food, then they would come to us. And in fact, they have. We have now a 30 uh, lab consortium of scientists around the world working on the disease. So fast forward, we found the gene ourselves, my husband and I working in a lab at Harvard at night, um, and, and went on to um, clone the gene and then um, patent the gene with uh, other universities that were involved. There were two of them. Um, all of that gave us a real interesting perspective because we essentially plunged ourselves into being somewhat citizen scientists, again, no background in this, but getting kind of the uh, on the on the spot, on the street uh, education. We needed to do the work we needed to do, we thought. And at the same time, we kept thinking this system is not really very good if every single disease has to have this happen to it. Of course, in the common disease realm, it's completely different, although not so different in some re regards. So a lot of the competition certainly exists. A lot of the not learning uh, one from another, uh, one lab from another, one research community from another exists. And so we've begun to think about those things as well. So when we think about s all the stuff that you all have been listening to this morning and will continue to listen to this afternoon, we're certainly very excited. And I have been um, intimately involved with NHGRI and with other institutes at NIH working with them, in fact, to support the science every way that I can from lobbying for appropriations on Capitol Hill to being part of planning committees and work groups and that sort of thing. And at the same time, you have to ask, 
What does this mean, though, to those people in the trenches? So since the time that my kids were diagnosed, I've met thousands of people with thousands of diseases and worked with thousands of other support groups because now I'm president and CEO of Genetic Alliance, which is an umbrella for about 1,200 of those groups. And what we see, of course, is real hope, but wariness about hype. And that when we hear about these discoveries and we learn the latest, most wonderful thing, um, we're delighted. And then what, soon what the community does is worry that that advance will not translate right away. And we all well know, and, and certainly the scientists know, and you writers know, that these, these uh, discoveries don't translate really fast. Um, that they, this is really work in terms of lifetimes, but we're really trying to get it done in, term, in terms of, of years or decades. And so there's a real tension between that hope and hype, and we try to balance that tension by certainly continuing to support discovery and really support the kinds of translational efforts that are being made, but at the same time try to be very pragmatic. My husband coined a term for it during the time that we were starting up, and he called it tempered urgency, that our urgency is huge. Our kids now are 20 and 22, they will be losing their vision somewhere around 30 or 40 years old. And so we have many less years to get done what we need done. It's still a long way to go, and we still look for the day that we can make a difference. Um, I think we also like to try to think in terms of systems. And so some of those include, for example, working with Congress. And as you all know, Congress has a great interest in the biomedical infrastructure of the country, and both Republicans and Democrats at different times, and some who become both a Republican and a Democrat, are interested in um, this issue. And what we find is that they often think throwing money at the cause will make a difference. We've seen that that's not always successful. And one wonders again is that it, are there ways that we could as a nation, as a people, as a community make a difference? And so we started looking at this issue carefully over the last couple of years. Again, this mounting frustration from parents of children who in some ways, I'm quite lucky. My kids will have a normal lifespan. They may be blind, but they'll have a normal lifespan. I work with other families whose kids potentially will die at age 13 or 11 or 5, and that's much more severe. So how do we keep their hope alive, get something done so that they can um, be able to see results, and at the same time follow these practical courses that science need? And when we work with Congress and talk to them about is just money going to make a difference, we think not. And so some of the things that we're looking at our programs uh, that we've undertaken, for example, one we call Grand Rx, which is Gateway to Rare and Neglected Disease Therapeutics, whereby we've said the system doesn't work. There are many roadblocks in it. Some have been named, like the Valley of Death, the medicinal chemistry kind of roadblock. There are others around cohort development, which we could go on for hours about. Uh, there are others around um, actual um, clinical trial development, et cetera. And certainly even some really w ones that should be very minor, like high-throughput assay development that just isn't what uh, academic labs are able to do so easily. So essentially what we've done is brought together a group of umbrella organizations like the National Organization of Rare Disorders, Faster Cures, Foundation Fighting Blindness, uh, et cetera, and said, how can we share our information, our infrastructure, and our resources to get something done today, and also to encourage the right kind of collaboration throughout industry, throughout government, et cetera. I think I'm most, um, and certainly all these activities are huge, and they're going to take a long time, and they're going to take a rethinking on all of our parts uh, about what we share and what we don't share, what's pre-competitive and what's not. I think I'm most struck, uh, though, in all of this uh, journey to, to go back to where I come from as a parent by my own children and what they declared when they were about 16 and 14 years old, uh, when we were very frustrated saying, you know, at that point we were, you know, far five, six years into having the gene, we still didn't have a treatment, we still don't, and we were very frustrated that we hadn't done much. And our daughter and our son kind of together playing off one another that night said, you know, you spend all your time fighting disease while we're living with disease. And when you shift your focus and understand what it means to live with disease, you'll understand how important what you're doing is and how much you've su succeeded already. So for me, um, certainly, to have children who can keep my eyes on the prize is helpful. And I think if all of us keep in mind what truly matters, the individuals that are suffering, it will really help all of us. Thank you. time for a few questions for Sharon. So please step up to the microphone if you're willing to step away from your sandwich. <laughs> that might be hard. What? Not too many questions. It looks like you want me to. Please. 
And you could use the short microphone again. <laughs> That's that wonderful short microphone. I really admire your work, Sharon. Congratulations on everything you've achieved. Um, I work in publications that are trying to communicate risk to the layman. And as you, we've all heard, um, we don't really know where we are. You know, we, we correlate things and then we try to make a statement about your risk. Um, how, and I'd like to hear your take on that statement as it's, um, you know, since you're in the, the business of interpreting it personally and dealing with it politically, um, what do you think we should say about risk to the public? So I think that's a terrific question. Uh, I don't know if you saw today, 23andMe had a 96 well plate get mixed up and they sent out the wrong results to um, their their uh, people, including one mother who apparently said, oh my God, my son was switched at the hospital. He is not related to me or my husband. Um, so which could be quite traumatic. Um, I. Th I think we're in a really difficult age. I'm excited by it. I kind of like the disruptiveness of trying to figure out what do we communicate, how do we communicate it. I mean, I think there's some good work going on with um, uh, Colleen McBride, with, um, with um, Bob Green, looking at what do people understand when they hear something. I think all of us know terribly well that we hear what we hear and that as much as we try to communicate, it's really gonna to be tough to get people to understand the level of complexity around the kind of stuff we heard this morning. So my um, kind of pitch always is to get as much information as possible out to uh, everyone so that there could be interpreters, because there will be, science writers are gonna interpret, disease groups will interpret, hospitals, clinics, clinics, et cetera, and then also to make sure that people have support to understand that they're, they are hearing what they're hearing. And that can take many forms, certainly genetic counseling, but I think also the various forums, et cetera, that have begun to be set up around what does this information mean. I think we're a long way from knowing what it means, and I think the quicker we can get more people's clinical information available and correlated to the actual uh, data will make a huge difference, but there's a bunch of hurdles there that we're trying to overcome. Hi, my name is Deborah Levinson, I'm here for the for the American Journal of Medical Genetics. And I'm wondering if you could comment on services like private access, which lets patients or the families of patients who are potential research subjects um, get together with researchers who are looking for such subjects and set, and it allows those patients or their families to set the amount of privacy they desire. I'm wondering if you can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of such a service. So I'll be really brief and also give the disclosure that, in fact, I, we're, Genetic Alliance is in a partnership with Private Access. Uh, you can go to privateaccess.com and look up the system, essentially allowing people to set their privacy preferences the way you do on Facebook. And we are actually quite excited by this, and that's why we're in a partnership with them, because we believe that the more people who enter projects like this that allow them to set a privacy preference and then uh, researchers to go in and search for those people, contact them as they wish, some people full privacy protection, some none, will allow people to be able to be more interactive in their own research, also allow researchers to recontact them and get increasing levels of participation in research. <coughs> Catherine Talmadge, American Dietetic Association. Um, so. With your experience and all the people that you deal with, with this gen who have been genetically tested and know these diseases that they have, how has that affected their ability to get health insurance, disability insurance, long-term care, uh, jobs? What kind of practical uh, advice do you have for that? So certainly in the case of employment and regular health insurance, GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, protects them now as long as the disease is not manifest. So we're just talking about just genetic information or familial information. Um, in the cases of long-term care and other issues, it was still really tough. And in fact, we know from some of the studies that others have done, if people are tested and they don't reveal the test to the long-term term care insurer and go and get long-term care insurance before they manifest the disease. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to be done there, and there are people like Anna Eshoo in Congress who are interested in protecting those people as well. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move right along, and we're going to have uh, our, our fourth panel, although this might not actually be a panel. We're going to do one and then the other, right, for time reasons. 
Zoom together. Okay. So this is on population genomics, and the first speaker is Terry Minolio, who runs um, NHGRI's Office of Population Genomics, and she'll be talking about population studies beyond GWAS, considering genes and the environment. Thanks, Eric, and, and sorry for the time pressures, but uh, but you guys are reporters, so you're used to that. So. Uh, one of the things that's new since uh, uh, 10 years ago is, is that NHGRI has moved into the, the population genomics area. Uh, we've defined this sort of ourselves uh, as a way of, of kind of putting together epidemiology and genomic technologies to apply these technologies to people with um, lots and lots of different characteristics that are, are available for research in that, um, and, and to learn really how genotype relates to phenotype, um, and then also to develop new population resources for this kind of work. Population-based research is an advantage because the findings can be generalized to everyone, not just those coming for clinical care or not just those with rare diseases. Um, the diseases, traits, or risk factors that characterize those people that are often referred to as phenotypes and the environmental exposures tend in studies like this to be defined in, in sort of standardized, reproducible, valid, transportable ways so that you can compare across studies. Generally, these need to be large to reduce um, spurious findings, sort of coincidental kinds of things, and, and allow meaningful subgroup analyses, particularly for uh, groups that are, are not uh, the majority population in the U.S. Uh, you heard earlier from uh, Francis Collins. Uh, he's for uh, many years have been, has been arguing that the U.S. needs a large prospective study of genes and environment. Uh, in 2004, he wrote this Nature Commentary in which he concluded that the time is right for the U.S. to consider such a project. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, coming together in, in a, a large research program to identify genetic and environmental influences on disease. Just recently, we held a um, uh, workshop to sort of examine what has happened in the past six years since he wrote that editorial uh, in terms of uh, what have we learned about doing these kinds of studies. This was just in January. And one that we learned from particularly was the UK Biobank, a study of 500,000 adults uh, that began about three years ago. As you can see here, they now have 484,000 people. That's actually of, as of 3 p.m. today. Uh, so it's ahead of time, but of course that's uh, Greenwich Daylight Time or whatever they call it. So. So we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, and, uh, and the BBC News actually uh, uh, about a month ago uh, noted that they were close to signing up their 500,000 participants. They project to be finished uh, end, of, end of this month, beginning of next month. Uh, that's at least six months ahead of time and considerably under budget, not unlike the Genome Project. So uh, challenges in conducting this kind of research, uh, one has to have good measures of environmental exposures. You have to have uh, good measures of phenotypes, and it would be great if you could get them from electronic medical records so that they're sort of already available, already collected in the course of clinical care. That does sort of take away the population basis of, of this because you have to have people who are coming to the doctor. Uh, in, in the UK, that's not a problem because everybody has a doctor. In the US, it's more of an issue. Uh, representativeness versus inclusiveness is a whole debate among epidemiologists that I won't go into in, in great detail. Can you have consent that, that sort of lives and breathes with the science? So as the science evolves, you don't have to go back for consent each time, or you can go back for consent each time if participants want you to do that. Uh, can you have widespread data sharing, and can you use existing studies and sort of in some ways kind of push them together um, instead of uh, collecting people anew? One of the things that the Biobank has shown is, is that there may be some major advantages to sort of changing the way we, we routinely do business at the NIH. Uh, we tend to have sort of distributed uh, models, as we call them, where we establish a, a clinical center at an academic site like this one, and actually many of them, um, and have them all send data into a central coordinating center, which may also itself be an academic site. Uh, all of those begin at the, at the beginning of a study, stay open um, throughout the, the course of the study. Uh, and the Women's Health Initiative is an, a good example of that kind of design. Another uh, possibility which Biobank has used is to start with your coordinating center, which may also be a, an academic site, uh, but then set up temporary um, clinics in places like uh, uh, warehouses, open office space, uh, wherever there might be available uh, low-cost space in areas where there's lots of uh, uh, transportation, et cetera, and shut them down once they've, they've kind of exhausted the area of, of uh, uh, available participants uh, so that you're, you're constantly sort of moving from one place to another. Uh, this has been and termed a centralized administration, and actually the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey uses this model, uh, although they use uh, uh, vans to, to do their, their exams. 
So key points that we learned about these kinds of studies is that recruitment is it's, um, very, it, it's useful to have a high recruitment yield so that of all the people that you invite, 80, 90% of them come in, you avoid biases that way. That doesn't happen anymore. It maybe used to happen in the 1920s, but uh, certainly not now. And probably it's okay to go ahead and just invite lots and lots of people and as long as you get a diversity of them from lots of different backgrounds, including racial, ethnic diversity, socioeconomic, geographic, cultural, you probably are okay. You'd, you'd like to set it up in a population that allows follow-up, so setting, setting it up in a clinic that has electronic records that you can link to. You want to make sure that the cost per, or recognize the cost per participant recruited is the driving force in cost efficiency, and cost efficiency is really important in these kinds of studies. Uh, the centralized model may be a better, uh, better approach. And in funding, it's important to recognize that you need uh, sort of clear, straightforward lines of leadership and, uh, and organizational authority. Uh, I think I'm going to skip over gene environment interactions because time is short, just to mention that one that you probably may have seen in, in high school long ago, this is the peppered moth, um, and here, here is uh, the wild type moth and the, uh, the sort of mutant variant moth on a soot colored uh, tree, and then a, uh, a soot colored moth and the regular moth. Uh, on a lichen-covered tree. Uh, this is a, a gene environment interaction where these moths recognized that in order to survive, uh, they needed to change their spots, as it were. Um, but the, really, the environmental factor here is this fellow, um, the Paris major who was going after them. Um, without him or her, uh, there, there wouldn't have been this, this, the importance of this variation. We have the same kinds of interactions with our environment, uh, ourselves, and our, and our genetic factors. Uh, this is a huge area, and, and really, in order to be able to study it, you need very large numbers of people because not all of them carry the soot-colored gene and not all of them live in, in environments with a Paris major near it. Uh, so as I said, I'll, I'm going to skip over this just to, to make the point that genes and environment, um, uh, when, you, when you kind of contrast the ease of measure, measure, measuring the environment is very difficult. Variability is high. You can have a, a variety of biases in the, collection, in the information you collect. And, and understanding the temporal relationship to disease development can be very hard. So Larry asked me to sort of look forward in terms of, you know, what might be the six easy ways that we would implement a large U.S. prospective study. Well, we'd first like to find inexpensive, simple, and reliable measures of key environmental exposures, key things like diet. Not an easy thing to measure, um, not one that we're, we're likely to be able to crack anytime soon. Whoops. Uh, well, I'm not going to be able to go up. Um, so we'd like to find inexpensive, simple, reliable measures of a broad range of phenotypes, a broad range of diseases that you can measure really uh, quite, quite easily. Again, not a simple thing to do. Um, another simple thing, cut recruitment or exam costs by 90% or more. Uh, the Biobank is, is doing this, their study well under a tenth of what we had estimated it would cost a, a similar study in the U.S. to, to be done. Um, uh, very challenging in this, in this environment. Um, it would be great to find standardized, readily accessible, and reliable electronic medical records. There are no such things in the U.S. They are coming, uh, and maybe, you know, 10 years from now, uh, we, we may have them, uh, but they certainly wouldn't be, you know, penetrating uh, all of the, the medical systems in the U.S. Um, we, we certainly need to mirror the full richness and diversity of the U.S. population in the recruited sample, and there are some groups that are much harder to recruit than others, and a lot more constraints in them, and, that, and, and that's going to be another challenge as well. And then finally, vesting the responsibility in the study leadership um, and having them backed by simple and clear lines of authority. So in many ways, we're trying to change some paradigms here in order to, uh, to get this done. I'm a big Gary Larson fan, and, and much like these guys, hey, they're lighting their arrows. Can they do that? Uh, and so what we're, what we're trying to do is not burn the, uh, burn the house down, but at least change a few paradigms. So I, I think I'll stop there. Uh, and then you, you'll introduce Charles. Yeah. I can jump. Okay. And our, our next speaker in this, um, in this panel is uh, an intramural researcher at NHGRI, Charles Rotimi, who will talk about race and ethnicity and genetics, defining the population to be studied in interpretation of group genomic data. Charles, you have a yeah. PowerPoint here somewhere? Mm -hmm. Right there. Got it. Okay. Good afternoon. I'll try to speed up also. Um, what I wanted to share with you is some of the uh, difficulty that we experience in defining populations, um, and that we definitely include myself um, in, this, uh, in this struggle. So um, typically when we are designing study or when we are interpreting study, we tend to do it along uh, the lines of, uh, you know, continent, national, ethnic, and tribal uh, orientation. And then we have issues dealing with admixture where we really 
know that people are coming from uh, in different uh, uh, human populations that have been isolated from each other for a long time. And uh, that long time could be uh, 10 generations. It could be much longer than that. And then we have uh, issues dealing with ancestry. Uh, you know, as, uh, as reporters, I think you have to look at data when they are being presented and ask very uh, uh, you know, serious questions. One of, the, one of the things that you typically hear is Africa. And the question we usually ask is, are you talking about Africa or are you talking about sub-Saharan Africa? So even at the level of continent, we have confusion in terms of defining population. Typically, when people say Africa, they are indeed, in, in terms of genetics, they are indeed referring to sub-Saharan Africa, not, not Africa. Because in, for the most part, as you will see in the next slide, uh, that people uh, in North Africa are typically clustered uh, with uh, other uh, European ancestry populations uh, to define what we call white, okay? So in the context of the U.S. Uh, census, for example, or U uh, U.S. government, uh, white is defined as uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, and uh, North Africa. So you can see where uh, the confusions uh, can come in, even at the level of, uh, of, of uh, continents, uh, you know. So those are some of the uh, difficulty. Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, again, the U.S. Uh, census, one of the things that is most constant about the U.S. census uh, is that it's going to change. The definition of race and ethnicity and how we identify them is going to change every 10 years. You almost can bet on it. Uh, and and uh, because of that, it becomes very, very difficult uh, to actually understand what it means and to, to be able to use it in any kind of systematic manner. Uh, the question I typically will ask my genetics friend is, if you have a variable that you know will change that much, will you have any confidence on any terms of putting in your model? Uh, the, the answer to that is, is no. But in the context of race and ethnicity, we are very comfortable with that uh, um, lack of robustness uh, because we think we know what it is, and uh, so we, uh, we constantly use it. So in terms of, the, uh, again, the U.S. Census, uh, there is a good disclaimer uh, when you go to the U.S. Census that what they are trying to do is not to ascribe any kind of biological, anthropological meaning or genetic meaning to the group that they are defining. They are trying to collect political, economic, and social data in the way that they can monitor certain things in the environment uh, and how society is structured and how that, uh, how that structure is impacting on people's health, people's economic well-being, uh, the neighborhoods that people live in. So, but in, in science, we, we tend to ignore this disclaimer and use it as if it's some kind of uh, very robust uh, set of variables. And, and uh, that creates all sorts of problems. Uh, for example, the, the group called Hispanic can claim any racial group they like, really. Uh, so, so this is the most recent uh, category that you do find in the, uh, in the uh, 2010 U.S. Census. Uh, what you do see is we do have issues dealing with ethnicity, um, whether you are of Hispanic or not Hispanic, and if you are Hispanic, what part of Hispanic origin are you? And then the issue of race, you have white, black, you know, the traditional kind of category, uh, Native American, and then you have all these other categories here. These are national and ethnic and all the combined, you know, so there's really no clarity, uh, you know, in terms of uh, 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 what you actually define when you, when you are developing this model. For example, when we did the half map, we didn't say Chinese, we say Han Chinese. You know, but when you look at this category here, it just says Chinese. So you can see where things get very, very fuzzy and, and difficult. So part of the difficulty, again, is really the fact that we all started somewhere in Africa. So really beneath our skin, we are all Africans. So it depends on the level of, of resolution that you are talking about or how many generations that you are talking about that you, you, you have to now say somebody was in, is still in Africa or somebody went out of Africa uh, again, looking at this kind of migration. But the important thing is that this migration is ongoing. It did not stop because people le left Africa. So there's still migration going on between in Africa and outside of Africa also. So as a result of this, a lot of the, the variation that we see is indeed shared, okay? But there are some that are not shared because people needed to survive new environment, okay? And so there are, again, uh, some uh, rare variants or variants that are not commonly shared. So in the context of uh, Africa, uh, again, this is really problematic because 
just because of the evolutionary history of the, of the continent, uh, it is indeed the oldest uh, part of, human beings have lived the longest here, and, and because of that, you do see all sorts of mixing. By using language and genetic variation, uh, Sarah Tishkoff and her group were able to come up with what she called about six clusters. But those are indeed very, very difficult things to, to understand because these are constant migrational processes. So you do have one of the real, I think, important information that came out of this study is that you do have a lot of admixing going on, but they are ancient admixing uh, that is going on, not in terms of what you talk about when you're referring to African Americans, for example, or Mexican Americans. So it, what is the implication of that diversity? Recently, uh, you, you, I'm sure you saw this publication in Nature, uh, where the sequencing of uh, Africans, uh, or Southern African, uh, was uh, published. Uh, one of the things that came out very clearly in this study is that just like what we've been doing in the past, by taking one African population and comparing to European or Asians, and we're able to draw these clean clusters, you can also do the same thing within Africa. Again, it just depends on the level of resolution you're talking about, the number of markers that you have. So I, the question I ask, you know, I have for you, what does it mean, therefore, to be able to distinguish or form these clusters? I, I, I think it's a question that we need to think about. So this is, this is huge, and I think genetics is new for a long time, that whenever you sequence an African genome, you always find new things, <coughs> okay? Uh, on average, uh, this, uh, the two Bushmen, uh, in our study, this is a quote from these uh, investigators, say they are more different, you know, than when you compare them to a European <coughs> or an Asian. And they are even more different, you know, compared to West Africans. So what do we mean when we say African? Yeah, when we are using that, that phrase. Okay, the danger of group labeling, and I'll quickly go through this. So the question I have is, how do we interpret differences in drug response by group when group definition is imprecise, fluid, and time dependent? Okay. And can we tell how an individual will respond based on group data? I think there's a confusion. Group identity is confused with group ancestry. For example, when you say African American, African American can have all sorts of combination of ancestry. So when you treat African American as one group, what are you really doing at the genetic level? Or even at the cultural level? So who is black? I'm sure you know these two guys here who are excellent golfers. Completely, they look, you know, in terms of skin complexion, um, you know, you can say the, they look very, very similar, but very different ancestral background, very, very different. Uh, these are aborigines, uh, this is uh, from Ethiopia, Maasai, and you have all sorts of combination of here, so who is black? <coughs> One of the uh, um, interesting uh, translation I think that have happened in genetics, at least for common condition, is this uh, HLA uh, variant that is highly, highly predicted, or predict, uh, predictable of somebody getting um, uh, you know, hyperreactivity to, to this particular avocado drug. And before the FDA made its decision about who to screen, there was some discussion about maybe we should screen only Europeans uh, because it made sense because uh, the prevalence was about 8% and you needed to treat only, to screen uh, about 14% to get, to get the advantage. But that was because of a wrong interpretation of that we were putting in terms of the human genetic variation for this particular variant. So when, what we did recently was we wanted to look at how frequent is this variant when we look at uh, different half map populations. So we looked at about 11 half map populations. What you do see is that the highest frequency was reported uh, again among the uh, Indians that were in the half map project, okay? And in, uh, in Africa, there was huge variability. Uh, again, here I'm referring to uh, you know, the Maasai and the Yoruba specifically. And among the Maasai, it was about 14%. It's almost, we couldn't find it among the Yorubas. So uh, in, uh, in Europe, you, you find that it's about uh, anywhere from about 3% to about 8%. So the point I want to make with this slide is that the label African or black render radically different allele frequency invisible, as you can see here. Okay. So it, it wants me to be, again, very, very careful. The wrong public health decisions uh, could have been reached, but FDA got it right because FDA said everybody should be screened. Okay? So the wrong public health could have been reached if, if uh, we have gone with our poor understanding. This is another uh, one, uh, slide I wanted to use to demonstrate for African Americans why we need to be very careful when we use the word African American as if it's a monolithic group. 
Okay, so this is a study that was published in 2008 uh, in Nature Medicine, looking at uh, beta blockers and the genetic basis of response to beta blockers. So one of the things that came out from this very, I think, well done study was the fact that it looks like about 40% of African Americans have what you may classify as natural beta blocker. So they really don't need a beta blocker. They won't benefit from it if you give it to them. And that's precisely what you will see here, okay? So for those that don't have that particular variant, if you give them a beta blocker, they do quite well, okay? They do better. But for those that have that particular variant, th there's no difference whether you give them beta blocker or not. So what happens when you combine 40% and 60% together, you, you come to the conclusion that maybe beta blocker doesn't work very well in African American, but that's precisely wrong conclusion uh, again, you know, so, and the reason for that uh, is, is very clear. This was a study that was done again recently, uh, published in a PNAS, <coughs> that shows very clearly that among African American, the distribution of ancestry is very, very different. Some can have almost zero uh, West African ancestry, while some might have almost 100% European ancestry, and they are self-identified as African American. Hence, you see those kind of variability when you look at it from a genetic level, okay? So the take home message here is that individuals cannot be treated as representative for all those who physically resemble them or have some of the same ancestry. That's really the take home message. And, and I'll end with this slide you know, to say that when we are defining race and we are using race and we think we know what it is, I think you need to really question yourself uh, and ask the question that of every human being on this planet, if I, if I, if I touch them on their shoulder and they turn around and look at me, can I really put them in one racial group? If, you, if the answer to that question is no, then the concept of race is indeed very difficult to deal with. So the point I want to make here is that using, race to using genetics to define race is like slicing soup. It stays mixed no matter how you cut it. And I thank you very much. Okay, we are opening this uh, duo panel to questions. Uh oh, reporters are getting tired. <laughs> Post lunch. Post lunch. Here's a question. Um, I'm Jocelyn Kaiser with Science Magazine. Um, Terry, I just wanted to ask you so, where are you with this possible U.S. Poss uh, Study. Yeah, no, and those, those six easy steps that I mentioned are, are the things that we're trying to explore now. So, so if you take a look at the Common Fund, which is the NIH sort of central research plan for kind of new and innovative ideas, this is on it um, as, a, as an FY11, so something with starting in October of, of this year, an FY11 exploratory project, basically. And so we'll, we'll be looking at, at particularly these issues of, of, you know, can we recruit through um, uh, systems with electronic medical records, such as HMOs or, you know, large-scale uh, integrated medical systems and, and that. Uh, can we accept low recruitment yields? Will we be able to, uh, uh, to get a, a wide representation of, of um, uh, ethnic and socioeconomic and, and rural um, uh, urban areas and, and that? So, so all of those are sort of exploratory things right now. So then what would it take to actually launch the study? Would it take a separate appropriation or? It's unclear that, you know, it all, of course it depends on how much it would cost. If, if we could do it for the cost of the biobank, then probably not. Um, I suspect that, that even if we were to adopt all of their their approaches and all of them worked here, which is a big question. Um, it still would probably cost us mm, three to four times what it costs them to, to do it because of our, our funding structures are, are just differently organized. Uh, but even then, you know, that might be something that could be absorbed, it might not. And, and so I, I don't think we really know until we have a good cost estimate for it. Um, Terry, I mean, in, in hearing Charles's talk and thinking about what a a large population-based study would look like. In the lessons from Biobank, what are sort of the, what are the implications of what, what can be generalized from the experience in England in terms of their population diversity, what would have to be faced in the United States? Yeah, I, I like to think of population diversity in, in Britain as being, you know, like Wales. I mean, that's 
that's really different than the rest of, of Britain. Um, but uh, at least in, in, their, in their perspective, it is. Now, they have a small minority population, but it's really small. It's like 4 or 5% of, the, of the, their population is, is sort of the, the colonies come home, as it were. So, so um, uh, South Asian in, in particular uh, and other uh, African and, and that um, areas. Uh, so, so they did not go in, into any uh, really extraordinary effort to try to get those groups because the numbers were so small. I, I think we would, we would definitely need to do that. Now, how diverse do you get? How small a subgroup do you get to? I think that's something else that we'll need to be exploring in the next year or so and figure out exactly what, what subgroups we're talking about. And costs will drive a lot of this, of course. Uh, we, we probably will have to. I mean, right. you know, sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good, as they right. say. Steve Sternberg, USA Today. Are there any lessons to be learned from decode and the Iceland experience? There are. Um, I think, you know, one of the the clear lessons that that was learned from that is is that there can be small subgroups that are violently opposed to to an idea when the vast majority of a population is not opposed to it and, and can really kind of bring down a, you know, a proposal. So in, in Iceland, as you, as you may recall, uh, there was a proposal for what's called an opt-out model where, where basically they would take everybody in the population, link them all to their medical records unless people said they didn't want to be part of that. Um, the vast majority of the Icelandic population, like most Scandinavian populations, are very positive about research and had no problem with that at all. A, a small, very vocal subgroup had tremendous problems with it. Um, and, and basically probably because, or perhaps because there wasn't enough groundwork laid, um, that, that particular part of DECODE was, not, was never done. So they never did link to the, the medical records in the way that they had proposed. What they did was to do sort of a traditional, you know, bring people in, get their consent, and, and then link to their records. So, so that's an important lesson, and I think the Vanderbilt um, experience uh, with their BioView repository, where they did extensive consultations within the community. Uh, to, to address these kinds of concerns. They've lived with an opt-out opt model and it's done quite well. Um, so, so I think that the community consultation part, which the UK Biobank has done extremely well, um, is, a, is uh, one, one lesson from them. Another is, is that uh, an automated robotic uh, biorepository is, is critical to the success of these very large scale studies. And, and so that's probably something we need to build as well. Yeah, yes. hi, I'm Sue Darcy from the Gray Sheet. I had a question for Mr. Rotini. So, I gather from your discussion about how mixed everybody is in race, there's, there's almost, it sounds like there's almost no point in picking out a certain population based on their phenotype and then saying, we're just going to test this population for such and such a disease. Because really almost anybody could have it because everybody's so mixed. Is that your conclusion or what, what would you do? Uh, no, th th that's not my conclusion. My conclusion is that the, the way we use these terms uh, are so fluid that they, they really don't have precise boundaries. Uh, but it's still, uh, it's still important, especially in the context of gene environment interactions, to, to, to define the population that you're studying. You know, for example, when I'm doing a work, uh, in, you know, I'm doing a study among, uh, in Africa, I, I don't just say Africa. Uh, you know, I say Yoruba, you know, in Ibado. Uh, and uh, because they in this, what I'm trying to understand there is how being a Yoruba, uh, with all your genetic background, your cultural you know, background, how that will inform my own design of my study and how I will study, uh, go about doing the various studies. So the, the, the idea is not to ignore grouping, but is to define group more precisely and, and not to use these global labels that we use uh, uh, in, in the way we do our study. That, that's really the, 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 the but, problem. But then what do you do about someone who So, so precisely, uh, again, if you look at African American, for example, I do a study among African American, and I'll tell you the only definition I have that I can consistently use to define an African American is the descendant of the middle, middle passage. Any other definition is imprecise and it will not do. And that definition is not genetic. It's, what does that mean? I, that is uh, uh, the uh, people who have ancestors who came through the slave trade to the, to the America are the only way you can consistently define what an African American is. So in that context, I am not an African American because I, I came from Nigeria 20 years ago. 
you know, to the United States. I am not an African American. Okay. Well, do we have one more? Take one more, and then we'll move on. Um, I'm Rita Rubin from USA Today. Um, what, from your presentation, um, what does that mean for drugs? I, I keep thinking of Bidel and kind of the reaction when that came on the market, that this is a drug for, for black patients, and like, well, so who's black? And are people, are people still pursuing that line of research for drugs, or are they, or as you said, m you know, looking more for genetic variations that, that could be targeted, and not just what, you know, if a person appears to be black or white? I, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, people are still pursuing that kind of uh, design strategy. People are still using these global labels to, to uh, do the initial recruitment for studies. But you know, later on, people do know that not all members of that particular group will carry that variant that you are interested in studying. You know, for the example that I gave you with beta blockers, uh, for example. So the fact that you are looking at, quote, African American doesn't mean that that particular gene or variant is a characteristic of that group. It is not, because not all members of that group would have it. It may be more frequent in one group versus another. It doesn't mean that it defines that group. I think that's part of the problem um, you know, that, that we encounter. So the answer to your question is yes, unfortunately, some of this is still going on, because we right now don't have a better way to do some of these things. So we basically use these proxies uh, to move forward. Uh, but it's also important to use this group in the context of gene environment interaction. That's the point I really want to make. Because being an African American in, within the US experience means something very specific, you know, in terms of social experiences. And if you're trying to understand how that social experience, you know, puts somebody at risk for getting certain disease, then it, it becomes a, uh, a reasonable design strategy uh, you know, to use. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to thank Charles and Terry for their presentation. <laughs> We will move on now to panel number five, medical application of genomic research. And our first speaker is Les Biesecker, another investigator from NHGRI's intramural program, who will be uh, discussing CLINSI, or I guess genome sequencing in medical care and research, and specifically talking about the CLINSI project. Do you have a PowerPoint? No. Oh, we'll leave you blank. Yes, please. Okay. Can I close it? Can I? Here, I'll, actually, I'll do it this way, and on the computer. Good afternoon. Hopefully you guys aren't uh, totally into post-lunch hypoglycemia yet. Close, I can tell. All right, I'll try and keep it uh, uh, brief and hopefully um, at least somewhat lively uh, to see if we can get you to stay with us here. So um, I am what my English colleagues disparagingly refer to as a medic. This is what scientists say when they want to sort of keep the clinicians in their place. Uh, and my job is to figure out how to use these technologies to answer questions. And I have a very simple job. I have to answer just three questions that my patients ask. They ask, what's wrong with me? What caused it? And what can we do about it? Really simple questions. And like Sharon Terry said, you would think that for most of the things that people walk into a clinician's office and ask those questions for, that there would actually be answers to those questions. And as Sharon discovered in her particular case, and I can tell you for thousands of other cases, it is in fact not the case. And so we have to address that. And so what we want to try and do is use these genomic technologies to try and answer those embarrassingly simple yet difficult questions. And if you take a little bit of a step back from that, the bigger picture is, is that we want to begin to develop an, a paradigm for individualized or personalized medicine. And I think I was told Francis mentioned that concept this morning. Is that correct, Eric? Personalized medicine. And the notion being that we want to be able to pinpoint risks and give individual risks and individual treatments to patients that are appropriate and tailored to them. And this is based on a couple of fairly simple ideas. All of us know that our family histories tell us that we have more or less susceptibilities to various diseases. Very well known, and that's 
evidence that there is a genetic or inherited susceptibility to traits. We also know that for most diseases, if you diagnose them and treat them earlier as opposed to later, the outcome is better, and in fact, the costs are less. And in fact, it may be the case that if you diagnose very early, that is before any symptoms arise, pre-symptomatic diagnosis, that may be even more powerful. We also know that there is huge inter-individual variation in responses to treatments. Charles Rodemey talked about that a second ago. The response of an individual patient to a treatment, both its efficacy, how well it works to treat the disease, as well as the side effects that that drug generates, varies a lot from person to person, and much of that variation is probably attributable to inherited differences in genes. So we know that there's a strong theoretical basis for personalizing and individualized medicine. How do we go about doing it? What we do, what we need to do is develop a research basis that allows us to make these predictions, because that's what this business really is. We're in the prediction business. This is a tough business to be in. All of you have been involved, I'm sure, with the medical system at some point or another, and what docs do is they evaluate you and they're making predictions and trying to figure out what's the right thing to do for you based on what they think is going to happen to you based on whatever parameters they have. So these considerations led us to develop a research program called ClinSeq. And the ClinSeq project is a project that is designed to pilot large-scale medical sequencing, or medical genomics, if you will, and, and develop abilities to correlate genetic inter-individual variation with traits, diseases, susceptibilities, liabilities to disease. So our initial focus, we had to pick a target to focus the study on. Our initial focus was atherosclerosis, or coronary artery disease. And we picked that trait because we already know that it has a complex genetic architecture. That is, it has significant environmental components, and it has significant genetic components, and there are common genetic variants that, pre that raise or lower your susceptibility to coronary vascular disease, as well as there are rare variants that massively increase or potentially decrease your susceptibility to this trait. And we thought that would be an excellent target to pilot large-scale sequencing to answer these kinds of questions. So how are we doing it? So this study started uh, back in uh, 2007, and we're recruiting 1,500 patients to the NIH Clinical Center up in Bethesda, Maryland. For patients to come, they undergo about a half-day clinical evaluation to assess their phenotype, collect blood for sequencing, and that DNA, is, uh, DNA from that blood is sent up to the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center, you heard from Jim Mulliken, uh, where the genes are sequenced. Now, initially, we start out because this study began in 2007, we were using that old-fashioned technology that Jim Mulliken mentioned to you, PCR amplification and 3730 capillary sequencing to sequence about 200, 250 genes that were known or suspected to be associated with coronary heart disease. Now, the, the technologies have increased as fast as we predicted, and so this study is changing as fast as we can, and we are rapidly expanding into sequencing entire exomes, or all exons of the genes of these patients, as well as in a few selected cases, which you'll hear about in a bit, the entire genome sequence of selected individuals from this cohort. And what our goal is, is to take this massive fire hose of data that we're generating and is flowing out of the sequencing center, and take all of the variants that we can find and associate them with the traits, the phenotypes that the patients have, again, in order to try and derive from that associations of predictions of what variants go with what diseases. So there's two attributes of the study I want to emphasize to you. The first is that when you do whole genome interrogation at this level, you are acquiring data on both rare and common variation. There's been a lot of uh, information, a lot of things in the media as well about chip testing or gene chips. And remember that those technologies are high throughput, but they only assess genetic variants that you already know you should be looking for. 
most of them being relatively common variants. And most of those variants are associated with relatively modest changes in risk, higher or lower. It's very common to find a common gene variant that changes your risk from one being the baseline to maybe 1.07 that is 7% more likely to get a disease. And as you well know, most people in the population don't respond very well to these minor statistical kind of arguments like this. Patients want to know, doc, am I going to get it? I don't care if it's 7% more in the population. I want to know if it's me or not. And again, that's what this personalized medicine is about. The other interesting thing about uh, the study that we're uh, developing and trying to push forward is that we are returning the results from the sequencing study to the patient. And our assumption here is this, is that this is a scale of data. You heard about terabytes and terabits of information and gigabases of sequence. These are scales of information and data that people just cannot integrate on a personal level. When I'm in a room with a patient trying to explain the results of a single gene test, if I talk for 20 or 30 minutes to that patient, that patient is saturated with information before I'm done talking. That's one patient, one gene, one variant. So imagine me sitting in a room with maybe a computer or a laptop and going through three gigabases of data. It's not going to work. So what do we have to do? We have to figure out what are the subsets of these massive data sets that the patients actually want back because the assumption should be that different people will want different things. What are they going to do with the data? How do they interpret it? And how will they use it to change and modify their health care to their advantage, taking into account their histories, their predispositions, their preferences? And we think this is a key attribute of this study, is we want to hear this from the patients. There's no data on this essentially none. And it's a bad situation because whenever I talk about this issue, my colleagues are always raising their hands and saying, I think we should do this and I think we should do that. Opinions are rampant when there's no data. What I want is data. I want to know what the patients want, what the patients think, and how the patients will use it, and that will guide how we can go forward. The third thing I want to emphasize um, is that we're trying to change the medical paradigm a bit here. Most medical diagnosis is based upon a patient going to a doc with a symptom, a complaint, a concern, the doctor evaluating that patient, developing a set of possible explanations for those symptoms, and ordering some tests that address those possibilities, and trying to make a diagnosis. That's a way to approach medicine from a symptomatic sense. But with this sort of technology, you don't have to think about which genetic test to order because we're doing them all. When you sequence the entire genome of a patient, you're doing all genetic tests for all genes. And so you can actually flip the entire question around. You don't have to wait for the patient to come to you with a symptom. You can go into the patient's genome, you can sift that for variants that you know are associated with disease, and ask the patient, do you have this trait in your family? Do you have manifestations of this disorder? Do you have symptoms? Or you can examine the patient and look for a specific finding because of a variant that you know is there. This is potentially a very, very powerful approach to medicine. Now, the truth is this is not novel. We're already practicing this in medicine in a different way. We might call it newborn screening, all right? You screen hundreds of thousands of babies when they're born for traits that are going to affect a couple hundred of them. They're usually some terrible metabolic disease that usually within one to three weeks after birth will cause that patient to severely metabolically decompensate and often die. Well, we're not going to wait for that to happen. We do newborn screening and we pick these babies out and we say, nope, this one needs this very, very specialized management. And we're going to do that before they get sick because we know we can keep them alive, keep them healthier if we do it before they crash than after. So what we're doing basically is using the genome to try and generalize that approach to medicine. An example of what we've done in the study is uh, one of the genes in our 250 candidate genes is a gene called LDLR, the low-density lipoprotein receptor, a gene known to cause early-onset heart disease. 
causes a trait called familial hypercholesterolemia, an autosomal dominant rare form of very high cholesterol. We sequenced that gene, and several, about eight of our patients popped up with rare variants in that gene, including one patient who was a lady who was just diagnosed as having garden variety high cholesterol, did not have the diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. We brought her in. She wanted her results from that study. We counseled her based on that, and it turns out when we probed and pushed harder, she had a huge family history of people with severe early onset high cholesterol and early onset heart attacks, and now we're working through that family to identify the people who are at risk, test them, and get them treated. And this is not a patient who came to us and said, would you please figure out why I have early onset hypercholesterolemia? She came into the study, sequenced her, looked at the sequence, had a hit, and we worked from the sequence data back toward the patient. So this is what this whole project is about from my perspective, is this individualized, personalized, genomic approach to medicine where you take patients, you apply this technology to answer these simple questions that they have. What's wrong with me? What caused it? And what can I do about it? I'll stop there and we'll take some questions later. Do you want me to sit up here? Sit. Yeah. Sit. sit. Larry, sit. And um, we have with us, uh, to give a short presentation, uh, a participant of the ClinSeq project. Um, Rick Del Santro is here, uh, who is a volunteer uh, of and a, and a participant in this ClinSeq project, and we thought it would be interesting for you to hear some of his thoughts about his participation in this. No slides. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Rick Del Santro. I am a participant. I have no slides. I have no formal presentation. Just here to let you know my experience. I think that might be helpful for you. Um, I got started in the study in an unusual way. I bought into the, the myth. I bought into the story that if you um, ate well and if you worked out all the time, you know, kept yourself active and healthy, kept your cholesterol low, your triglycerides low, all would be well. And it's unfortunately not true. Um, I lost my mom at age 69 to her third uh, open heart surgery. I had a 37-year-old brother, totally asymptomatic, low cholesterol, low triglycerides, in good physical shape, have emergency double bypass surgery. I had a sister, very similar, 47 years old, had uh, two stents put in for blockages. Um, and so I forced myself upon a uh, cardiologist because my general practitioner God love him, said, God, you're, you're a specimen. You know, you're wonderful. You're totally fine. And so I went and saw a cardiologist, and he looked at me, literally. He picked my file up and looked at everything and said, what are you doing here? And I said, no, you got to hear my family history and, and, then, and then throw me out of your office. And so he did, and he said, okay, well, based upon that, why don't you go get a heart scan? And I did. And what they found out was that um, I had uh, off-the-charts calcification. And so he said, well, you better come back and we'll do a couple of more studies. We'll put you through some stress tests. Now, I've, I've run an Ironman before, so the stress tests were very easy for me. Um, that was not a big deal, and they really proved nothing other than I think that I was physically fit um, because they couldn't find anything. So I said, well, am I off the hook? And he said, well, the only way you'll ever really know is to, um, you know, have angioplast done, or I mean um, a catheterization done. And I said, well, okay, then let's do that, because I really want to know what are my blockages and, and how bad are they. And so that day when I had it done, um, I was uh, lying in uh, Sibley Hospital, and I was relaxing for four or six hours on my back, whichever it was, because I couldn't move. And somebody came over to me and said, hey, there's this really interesting study going on at NIH. Um, it's on, you know, hereditary, um, heredity and coronary artery disease, and would you be interested in potentially participating in it? And I said, well, sure, you know, maybe, you know, let me, uh, let me see what it's all about, and if I am, I'll call. And so I made a couple of calls over there and left messages, because they're all very busy folks, and somebody got back to me and said, hey, we'd love to have you come in. And apparently that was a good thing. So uh, in I came, and um, I remember uh, 
probably about a month after I'd been there, I'd gotten a call from, I think it was Dr. Clausen, Turner Clausen, or, uh, who I, I don't think is doing the study anymore, but at the time, he seemed almost giddy about my results and what they had found out about my family history and asked if my entire family would participate in the study, um, to which you know, I said, look, it's wonderful tests. It's more than you'll ever know about yourself. You'll go a lot deeper than probably your doctors will, so why don't you all participate? And, and they, of course, I have seven brothers and sisters and scattered across the country, and um, I think one by one they've all come in and, and they've been a part of this study. Um, and uh, one day, uh, you know, going forward after that had all begun, I found out that they were doing a full-body gene sequencing on me, which... You know, I was like, look, I was looking at them like, you know, they had antlers on their head. I have no idea what they were talking about. But they said, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to go through all of your genes, and we're going to study everything, and we're going to be able to tell you things about yourself that you don't know and potentially you don't even want to know. I said, ah, you know, I think I want to know. I mean, tell me. I, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that worries about anything before it happens. I want to know what it is, and then I'll worry. Um, otherwise, I'd be worried all the time. So they did, and they ran some, some tests, and, and they called me just before the holidays. It's ironic. And they said, well, we found something in your gene sequencing, but we can't really tell you what it is. I'm like, huh, right before the holidays, huh? I said, yes, you have to come in and meet with the doctor. It's like, okay, great. So uh, I said, well, look, it's, that's fine. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come in and, and meet with them. And, and they said that they had found something called... Uh, I was at HNPP, I think is what it's called, uh, hereditary neuro neuropathy, uh, pressure palsy. Again, meant nothing to me, may mean something to all of you, but meant absolutely nothing to me. And they said, do you ever experience numbness? And I said, yeah. Do you ever experience numbness in your extremities? I was like, yeah, all the time. Did you ever know what caused it? And I said, no, I had no idea. I always thought it was a, maybe associated with my back, putting pressure on my nerve endings. But this is something that candidly had happened for me for since my 20s. And it's gotten increasingly worse. Um, there's nothing you can do about it, by the way. It's just a hereditary thing. And so, um, but knowing was great because I now had an explanation for what I was doing or what was happening to me. And it at least allowed me to understand things I should and should not do to help um, alleviate or um, prevent it from going on for longer periods of time. Now, some of these numb, numbness spells go on for days, some for weeks, and some for months. Um, and uh, they said, well, you know, there is a pretty good chance that, you know, some of your siblings may have this as well. So if you want, you can call and share with them and see if any of them have had similar things, and which I did, and we've now come to find out that probably half of my family has that as well as a uh, hereditary trait, which uh, is interesting to know, and, and one of my brothers actually has it probably worse than me, and yes, as I stand here today, I can tell you I do have numbness in certain parts of my body. Um, it's just something I live with and deal with. It's, uh, it, it, it's not debilitating in any way. It's just annoying <laughs> is all it really is. So um, here's what I can tell you. Uh, the study for me has been fabulous. Um, it's very eye-opening. It's really great to understand what's going on uh, inside the hollowed halls of NIH, right? Because to me, NIH was a stop on the metro. Um, it was something you pass by as you're going through Bethesda, right? But I, once I got into that campus, I couldn't believe, you know, how much was actually going on there, how big the campus was. Um, and how committed uh, the entire staff is to what they're doing. Uh, it, for, for me, again, and that's the only perspective I can give you is mine, it, it's really been um, rewarding to participate in the study and to hear things and find out things about myself, about my family. Um, and, and now they're actually going generations and generations, and I think that we've just found out who... Some of my ancestors from Italy are, and so I think they're even drilling back that far in this history as, as they try to, um, you know, find traits uh, specific of my concern, really, uh, I have to tell you, is coronary artery disease. But anything else I find uh, is, is sort of icing on the cake. Um, two last thoughts, and I'll shut up and sit down and let you guys get on with important stuff. But um, one is, is that... Uh, 
last time I was uh, in to see uh, Dr. Basicker, um, he explained to me that they had found um, or were able to determine things for which I am a carrier. Um, and we went through a list of, I think it was four items I was a carrier for, and, and really happy to say that none of them were, you know, horrible things. They were things, but they were, in my opinion, small and not that significant, uh, which was great because I have two small children and would love to know what potentially uh, they could be in, in store for. So I think from that standpoint, it, it was uh, very, very important. Uh, the other thing I will tell you is that um, sort of the one thing that has always resonated from what they said to me when I began participating in the study is we're not sure if anything that we find out in the study will not necessarily help you, and it may not help your children, but we're pretty darn sure it's going to help your children's children. And for me, that was all the motivation I needed to participate in the study. So uh, from a layman's perspective, from a participant's perspective, is what they're doing good? Absolutely. Um, is it rewarding to participate in it? Yeah. Um, is it interesting to know what you have and, and what you're exposed to and explanations for things? Yeah, it, from my perspective, it is. I'm not sure everybody else would feel the same way, but again, that's all I can tell you is me. So appreciate uh, having a few minutes. I guess I'm going to stick around and answer questions if anybody has any of me, but um, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Okay, one more speaker before we're going to open up for questions. We're going to have the third speaker. Um, we're going to um, uh, sh shift gears from general exploration of genomes to focusing in on um, cancer in particular. And Brad Osenberger, a member of our NHGRI's extramural staff, is going to talk about a large project um, that is going on at NIH that he's heavily involved in called the Cancer Genome Atlas. All right. Thank you, Eric. Happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, a, a little shift from the, from the previous talks, uh, a little bit back towards some basic research, um, uh, but some that, that are going to be impacting patients soon. Um, the Cancer Genome Atlas, or what we call TCGA, um, is jointly run by the, the National Cancer Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, it's been going on now for a bit, and I'll give you a brief update. Let's start with uh, some of these grim statistics for cancer. Um, in the United States, uh, 10 million people have cancer. Uh, 1.4 million will be diagnosed this year, um, and 700,000 will die from cancer this year. Um, and this hasn't changed a lot in 20 years. Uh, like Francis Collins said this morning, 20 years ago, one of the calls for the Human Genome Project was so we could begin to understand cancer. Cancer is a disease of the genome. Each one of these 700,000 deaths is due to a somatic change, so a change in the genome in that tumor, resulting in the death of the patient, and by somatic mutation. These are, are changes different from what you were born with, so changes in the genome that are occurring in the tumor that you were born with. So this is, in a way, uh, uh, obvious uh, genomic problem. Uh, DNA sequencing problem in, in that we have the normal DNA. We have the person's germline DNA and, and can take the tumor DNA and compare those and identify every change that has occurred. And that's the goal of the, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project is to do such a thing. And this is just, just really just now possible. This is a, another version of some of the graphs you saw this morning. Uh, these are, this is the output in, in billions of bases of just the NHGRI-supported large-scale sequencing centers. Uh, through, the, through the end of the Human Genome Project, there were just incremental changes, nice steady climb. It was fantastic. But then in going from 07 to 08, notice the scale changes by 1,000. This was when we began to implement uh, the new sequencing instruments. Um, and you can see, so we project, this slide's actually a couple months old, this is probably going to be quite a bit higher, but we project we're going to produce greater than a thousand fold more sequence than we did just a couple, two or three years ago. So this has made it possible now to do the large numbers of cancer specimens, the, the 
comprehensive genomic analysis uh, is now feasible, and this is what we're undertaking. So with NCI, we've set up TCGA to take cancer specimens, uh, very tightly quality controlled, each specimen and a, 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 a tissue sample to provide the germline DNA is processed centrally in a core facility that then sends the DNA and RNA to a variety of genome characterization centers and sequencing centers where we do everything we can do on them. So they get gene expression analysis, SNP arrays, and comprehensive genomic sequencing, all on the same samples. Okay, so we have all the types of genomic data all on the single samples. Of course, all this is combined with, with as rich of clinical data that we can, we can obtain. All this is now going out, and this is a community resource project. All the data are being released as we get them. They are available uh, through NCI's data resources and, and, and NCBI, uh, through NIH databases. Um, and all these data are integrated, and we begin to develop this comprehensive knowledge of, of these particular cancers. And this is a kind of a glimpse of the future. Um, this is a single cancer patient, an ovarian cancer patient, what we call a genome card. And this is what we're building towards. We're still, we have to have these databases, these, these, this rich data to begin to understand the cancer, what's going on in the cancer. So it, it, part of it's that, but, but what we see in the future is that this is going to lead to individualized treatment for each tumor, each cancer patient. This is a, this is a, a single uh, ovarian patient. Uh, the genome, the, the cancer was sequenced 31 times over. This is deep coverage of the cancer genome, every base. The normal DNA was sequenced 30 times. We can see there were, there were only 17, 1,786 changes, single base changes in that genome. There are a lot of other changes. These are copy number variations where pieces have been duplicated or deleted. Um, this is the, the circos diagram of this cancer genome uh, showing all the chromosomes in a circle and recombination that's going on. Ovarian cancer is typically quite scrambled by the time it's extracted. This is a late stage tumor. And we get highlights, uh, the genes that are mutated, the ones that we suspect may be, may be involved in, the, in this cancer, uh, various tidbits of information about this cancer. But anyway, just to get a glimpse of, of where we're going to be going with, with uh, uh, being able to take a cancer and begin to figure out uh, what this particular tumor may respond to. Uh, one of our large-scale sequencing center directors uh, told me the other day that almost daily uh, he gets requests from somebody who's just been diagnosed with cancer, can you sequence my genome and help me figure out uh, what therapies might be best. Uh, just quickly where TCGA is now. We uh, started with a pilot a few years ago to do glioblastoma and ovarian cancers. Um, as we were coming towards the end of the, of the pilot phase, uh, the Recovery Act, uh, economic stimulus package hit, and, and uh, a, a fairly substantial bolus of money uh, was allocated to TCGA to, to try to accelerate it and expand it. And we, uh, uh, we indicated that we would be able to add 20 tumors to the project. Um, over this next two years or so. Uh, this is that list. Um, these tumors, uh, we already have data sets uh, becoming available at NIH uh, for each of these, some, some major ki uh, killers such as colon, uh, the, most ma the, the most prominent uh, killer in the United States, lung cancer, um, is here. And then what NCI is accruing. Um, uh, all these other tumor types, and, and these are being queued up uh, to follow. Um, uh, and this is on a very fast track, and we, we will begin to generate data on all of these uh, in the next year. We're not in this alone. Um, with the, the dissemination of, of DNA sequencing and this sort of technology, of course, uh, many countries have their own interests, and, and there's a, a lot of benefit in, in sharing our knowledge and working together across the globe. So TCGA participates in the International Cancer Genome Consortium. 
um, involving uh, some 11 countries and I think over 20 projects now. Um, there was a big uh, marker paper describing uh, the International Cancer Genome Consortium in the April 15th issue of Nature. Um, you can see things, uh, uh, people getting behind this, and, and this is a big commitment for a country to say they're going to do this cancer. Um, uh, for example, China doing gastric cancer it means they're making a big commitment to do hundreds of samples uh, across the whole uh, extent of the genome. So just to wrap up, <clears throat> TCGA is well underway. We, we uh, um, are really excited about the impact this is going to make uh, on cancer research, and we're already seeing uh, results reaching all the way to the clinic in glioblastoma. Um, we intend to, to do enough samples to go way down in power, uh, build our database to detect genes that mutate even as, as less than 5 percent of patients that get that, so um, really discover and catalog the entire breadth of tumors that may occur, in, uh, mutations that may occur in a given tumor. Um, of course, we'll reveal all the biomarkers, uh, the new therapeutic targets that uh, um, we can, and as I mentioned, uh, leading as we build this database, begin to understand the underlying biology, we'll begin to see the individualized approaches to therapy um, that will be enabled. Um, importantly, you know, you've heard a lot of technology talks, uh, descriptions for, from DNHGRI folks today, and uh, TCJ is breaking a lot of ground. Just this scale of genomic analysis is requiring huge new uh, pushes in, in technology and computational approaches. And, um, you know, Vivian Bonazzi's talk about managing the data, uh, TCGA is used to, to kind of break that ground in, in many cases across NIH. And finally, you know, the cancer patients will soon and forever benefit uh, from these data as we generate them. Thank you. Okay. This threesome is now open for questions. We're here. Hi, it's Renata Miles with the NCI Cancer Bulletin, and I actually had a question for Rick. Um, from the data they found with the sequencing of the genome, were there consequences to the treatment, perhaps, for the calcification? Well, to, to my uh, best knowledge right now, there hasn't been um, anything. I, I think uh, Dr. Biesecker can probably address that better. In my particular case, I mean, I'm obviously started on some uh, a statin to help uh, with the, the cholesterol uh, buildup, but, you know, from, from what I can tell, I still have to eat well and I still have to work out, but, um, you know, I've, I've had some choices I've had to make, unfortunately, but uh, nothing yet that, that has been, in my mind, a, a breakthrough, but I'm very optimistic. That's correct. So we haven't yet identified the gene variant that causes the uh, high susceptibility to coronary artery disease, and the absence of the usual things, as Rick beautifully outlined, there's you, all those risk factors that he doesn't have, and they have the high incidence of heart disease in spite of that. And that's the goal of this, trying to find the variant that causes that, because we would sure like to be able to do that, because Rick and his family are being missed. Everything the medical system is designed to look for that they don't have, we want to know who, who the families are that have that trait so we can evaluate and treat them aggressively, which we can't do now. Over here. Hi. I'm Rita Rubin from USA Today. I was kind of part of my question, but, um, you know, Dr. Bicycle, the woman you were uh, talking about who has a family, who has familial hypercholesterolemia, I mean, it almost seems to me that you're also um, implying that doctors are not doing a great job of family histories, and because this is something, as you said, you started to probe, and, there, and, I, and I've written a lot of, I've, you know, back 25 years about familiar hypercholesterolemia, and I know that you can see that in the families. Yeah. Um, and, and the other, just one other quick question is, and I wondered, and I'll ask you, Mr. Del Santro, it sounds like all your siblings were agreeable, to, you know, about participating, but what if you get, I mean, he has a big family. What happens when not all the siblings are agreeable? And because, you, like, you learned about the HMPP, I mean, I don't know, I'm kind of on the fence about what I want to know and what I don't want to know, so. 
Well, I'll, I'll let you, me. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, it's a great question. I didn't think necessarily all my, my uh, family would be uh, agreeable, and it turned out that they were, but that's a, it's a real concern. I mean, there are people, I, I'm sure, uh, amongst us today that don't want to know, that may may not want to know, and just say, look, you know, let me go through life as life is and, and not be alerted to things, And because the other side of, of finding out is, what if you have something really to worry about? Then do you get all consumed by that? And so I just looked at it and said, you know, I understand that, but I also understand that there's there's a there's a greater need to go down this road because if in my case with coronary artery disease, if there is something that that my children can do from birth that would counteract it, short of you know, you know, eating well and staying active then that's worth knowing. And is that something that maybe would consume them or, or make them worried? Or is that something where they would allow themselves to focus on prevention? Uh, just one other note um, on the question of family backgrounds. Now, I have had a wonderful, he just retired, wonderful general <coughs> practitioner who I thought was great. But I will tell you, I pleaded with him about my family history, and he never proactively did anything for me. So I think just as a, again, as a layman, just not a scientist, just as an individual like you folks are, although you probably understand a lot more of that than I do, um, it's, it, there probably is not enough family history being done today um, in, in backgrounds on families, but I'll let you answer. Yeah, it's a great question. This, uh, when we got into this project, we put in the LDLR gene and the ApoB gene because uh, they were basically positive controls for the study because it, my view of that was the same as yours. This is an old story. We know what these diseases are. We know how to diagnose them. We know how to treat them. But let's sort of uh, pepper the study with some positive controls so we see if we can find things and hit on them, et cetera. But it turned out to be much more than that, which is we found the patients who had these variants, and for most of the patients, the patients who were in our study were themselves correctly diagnosed as having hypercholesterolemia and were mostly well treated. But just as Rick says, the docs never asked them, does anyone else in your family have this? And we know that it's inherited as a dominant, so 50% of the people in the family are at very high risk of this devastating trait that is very readily treatable and can extend life by a couple of decades. And it was a shock to me. And it, it made me reflect on our entire medical system is not geared towards thinking this way about disease, but using the power of whether it's family history or a whole genome sequence, using genetics to find the patients who you need to be working really, really hard on and you leveraging that information to save lives. And the system's really not set up to do that. And it may turn out you know, we're, we're a technology-loving people, and we, we like our machines and our giga this and mega that. And it may turn out that this kind of information is the way we can actually do that. When I actually have a patient, I sit down with a room, and I sit down with them in a room and say, you have a variant in this gene, it causes this, and this is how it's inherited, then all these doors open, and we can start to work on that problem with this medical genetics paradigm that we know how to do. And that may be what it takes to open these doors and start to do this kind of work. Hi, I'm Andy Semino. I'm a health communication specialist with the National Institute of Nursing Research. And I have a question about tissue samples. I'm not really clear on how they're selected or acquired, um, if they're from one individual or, or many. And as we learn more about how cancer grows, will that um, impact how they're selected or used? Um, yeah, the initial list for TCJ were actually built by incidents because by the more they were higher impact research because they there there are more patients with that type of cancer, but also meant that there were greater stores. So TCJ began with with existing stores and clinical centers of the of the specimens, um, and the advantage of that also is that we had the full clinical record. Um, so so. We generally have the, the how the patient responded to, to treatment and, and other things. Uh, now NCI is also building a, a, 
prospective accrual network for the future where where samples will be collected specifically patients will be consented for the project and then they'll be followed over time but the 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 sample accrual is for a project of this scale is always difficult and requires both the stores legacy collections as well as the perspective Catherine Talmadge when you map out a cancer a person and the cancer cells genetically how far in advance of that person getting cancer can you predict they're going to get it I'm thinking particularly something like pancreatic cancer where people are diagnosed usually when it's too late yeah ovarian well ovarian cancer is such a tragic example where it's not it's you it's generally not diagnosed until very late stages and and so actually what we're studying for the most part in TCGA are in fact those late stage tumors but from that we believe we'll be able to kind of go back in the evolution a little bit and and be able to discern some of the the earlier events that are occurring and you know there's the potential then to discover new biomarkers that maybe will allow a much earlier diagnosis and that's true of all the tumor types you know we 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 hope to actually be able to kind of dissect out that evolution okay well I'd like to thank this panel for their participation and we are miraculously back on schedule essentially we are now scheduled for a 10 minute break so let's take the break you can talk to these these panelists there's also some drinks in the back and we will reconvene at about 25 after